Well, we're glad you're here this morning. We welcome you. But I need your help. If you could stand and let somebody else know. You have to go look for them. Okay? Go look for it and, and greet someone. Find out their name if you don't know it. How about that one? Because sometimes that happens too. By then, our kids will be here. begin to worship our Lord and our King. For He is good and He has brought us to church today, right? Amen.
Psalm 91. Whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Good morning. I am Jim Daniels, Director of Family Life. Um, and before you sit down, we love to get you connected to one another. So I have two questions I want you to ask someone not near you. One, what was the highlight of the week? That's an easy one. Highlight of the week. Second one, when have you experienced, when is it better to be gentle than rough? I know it's, yeah, when is it better to be gentle then rough. So those are the two. Highlight of the week. When's it better to be gentle than rough? So uh, this last week, I went to, to camp with middle schoolers, and I got to say, there was some fantastic things that happened there. Um, some of my highlights was uh, the treetop uh, experience. That's a ropes course that people got to um, climb on things and zip line on and all sorts of stuff. That was a lot of fun. We went to this lake in the middle of nowhere and jumped off of cliffs and all sorts of stuff. Lots of highlights for us this week. But with the second question, when's it better to be gentle than rough? If you ever stop by where we hang out with the youth, you'll notice we have an old school PS1, PlayStation 1, um, and we love that thing. But on there is a game called Gran Turismo, 
And when I bought that game, it was the best ever, but it was the most frustrating game ever because I do not take corners gently. I don't make food gently either, so don't ask for egg uh, over easy. It ain't going to happen. Your yolk is getting broke. And the same thing happens. I'm driving into the wall, then I'm driving into the other wall, and I can't control the car because I am not gentle. The idea of slight movements on the joystick, just uh, it's just too hard for me. And that makes it hard to play other games like first-person shooters and stuff like that where you have to have finite control. Gentleness is not something that's easy. Um, oftentimes, we just want to be rough. Uh, let's face it, sometimes we come across with other people kind of rough and we're kind of talked down to them or we're rude or we're, and sometimes it would be much better if we were gentle. To, so today in CC Kids, we're going to be reading and uh, watching videos about Jesus hanging out with some people that everybody else treated rudely. All the other people tried to avoid these and ignore them. But Jesus was super gentle with them, and it changed a lot of opinions because of that. So if you're online today, we, I can't wait to get online a little later and see what you put for your answers. Uh, but after this service, you can jump on and watch the same videos that we're watching and get some of the same parent questions that we give out every week here. Um, and we would love for you to join with us in that, especially if you have kids. If you don't, yeah, maybe it's just fun to watch. Veggie Tales was kind of like that. All right. The other thing I want to let you know about in two, two weeks, when we get back from senior high camp, all of the students that went a couple weeks ago to the fifth, six, last week to the middle school, and this next week, uh, starting next Sunday, uh, for high school, we're going to be up here telling you about our experience and thanking you and uh, letting you know uh, about the amazing uh, opportunities we had, but also experiences. So I hope you're looking forward to that. Um, and thank you for having us up here. All right, this is a new song. It's called King of Kings, and you can stand. Till from heaven you came running, there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets to a virgin came the word from the throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt.
that you rose, all of heaven held its breath. Till the stone was moved for good, and the Lamb had conquered death, and the dead rose from their tombs, and the angels stood in awe. For the souls of all had come, and the Father are restored. And the church of Christ was born, and the Spirit lit the flame. Now the gospel truth of all shall not kneel, shall not faint. By his blood and by his name, and his freedom I am free. For the love of Jesus Christ. Who has resurrected me? Praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit, three in one. God of glory, majesty, praise for. power of your spirit, you are at work in our world in this place. And God, today we ask that uh, you would be with the leaders of our world, that you would give them wisdom, guidance, and direction, because in the unity of this moment, our spirits are connected, asking for you to move, for it is only when God's people offer a prayer together that we have power power that comes from the Spirit, that moves and intercedes for the needs of others. Lord, we also pray for those who are far from you, or maybe not too close, or maybe they just lack peace, or maybe they're facing a difficult situation. Lord, you know what the complication is. We're aware that they're challenged, and so we lift them up to you by the power and presence of your Spirit to give them that peace that surpasses all understanding, even now as we pray. For those that are overcoming physical challenges, Lord, heal and restore. For those that are facing a, a mental challenge or an emotional issue or just a friendship issue, it happens. Maybe it's a family dynamic, some things that's not quite right. We know, Lord, that you move in every situation. So we just offer this prayer of asking you to make it pr yourself present in those lives, our lives. And most of all, we thank you for Jesus who taught us to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in spirit, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us into temptation. In the arm. <laughs> Amen. Sometimes I get off and I mess you up, so forgive me.
as a leading that. But you know what? God knows our hearts, and that's the best part, because that is the reason that we offer prayers together, is that we know and we have an opportunity to, uh, to come together. I'm going to be speaking in the message today, but before we go into the message, I just want to give a, a couple of announcements. You see in the back of your bulletin, you'll see that there's a couple of events. I think that we even have a, a slide for you, too. Two things. One is that uh, we're offering opportunities for, to support the Feed My Children. Some of you are aware of the, the food packing event, that that uh, particular group comes into a community and they look for lots of people. In fact, they think they, they generally uh, come in and it's ten to 15,000 packets that are done in a weekend or a two, three-day period. So uh, our group, uh, our church is supporting this uh, group out in, in Placer where all the Christians are coming together to do this. There's a fundraising event. The food packing event isn't until October, and you can sign up for that later, but if you'd like to be a part of that, you can go through the details. Donna is willing to raise your hand, Donna. You can, people can find Donna, and you can find out more information from her, or you can just contact the church office. We'll get you Donna's information. Also, our mission committee is, is collecting inf- uh, all kinds of items for, uh, for, the, for the drive to help coil school. In fact, a lot of uh, items have already come in. If you go back to the uh, office, you'll see uh, things that are being offered. There is a, a little card that is available. Actually, it's a sheet of paper because it's uh, an extensive list. So if you'd like to help out with, with kids at Coil, we would appreciate that. Coil is a school right over here at Mercy uh, Hospital, and so we've been supporting them for years, and they've really appreciated it. We've supported their staff uh, at different times of the year, so we just kind of have a relationship with them. We just want to love on them. So thank you for just... Uh, giving that help. What we hear from the principal is every little bit helps, so we're glad that we could be a part of that. Uh, it's, a, it's a change opportunity, and we're just glad that we can uh, offer this uh, to this uh, school that has uh, significant needs among their student population. So let's be in prayer for that. So thank you for, for that. Also, uh, I just want to say that uh, I'm concluding this series today. This is a Healthy Habit C. It's actually part six of this series of how to overcome discouragement. I couldn't figure out how to get it into one message, so I made it into three. That's as simple as I can make it. Uh, only because it keeps coming back to the same thing. Why do we have this challenge in the world. So I wanted to read some scripture to you today that comes to us from the 37th chapter and of, of the Psalms. And the psalmist, as you know, this is, uh, the psalmist lived a long time ago. David, we, we believe, you know, probably 3,000 years. So this is, just imagine this. This is a prayer of David, and it's 3,000 years old. But I want you to hear it in the context of a world that uh, is ever-changing but faces the same challenges. Notice this. This is the Psalm of David, verse 1. Don't worry about the wicked or envy those who do wrong. For like the grass, they soon fade away. Like spring flowers, they soon wither. Trust in the Lord and do good. Then you will live safely in the land and prosper. Take delight in the Lord and he will give you your heart's desires Commit everything you do to the Lord. Trust Him and He will help you. He will make your innocence radiate like the dawn. The justice of your cause will shine like the noonday sun. Be still in the presence of the Lord and wait patiently for Him to act. Don't worry about evil people who prosper or fret about their wicked schemes. And then this one, this is a little harder. Notice this, verse 8. Stop being angry. Turn from your rage. Don't lose your temper. It only leads to harm. And here the psalmist kind of just reminds us, life is better. Life is better for us if we just take the wisdom that we have. That wisdom that we find in the scriptures. uh, We saw earlier in this series, this psalm, keep your eyes open for God. Did you notice the background for the music this morning? Did you notice? Well, I'm going to show you a picture of it because I took the same thing. Be alert for the signs of his presence. You know, these, these, these pictures from the Webb telescope are fantastic. I thought the Hubble telescope stuff was pretty cool. But this is even more cool because we're actually closer, believe it or not, we're like 13 billion whatever away. And it always amazes me. And I was at Tahoe recently on vacation. And so we went out at night and I got to see the stars. I enjoy that kind of one of the most amazing things is to stand out and just see the firmament, the stars, not that close. (laughs) 
<laughs> Not that close. But it does give you an essence. One of the things that's always impressed me is astrophysicists, and they've done this uh, study with astrophysicists for a number of years. I'm talking like 20 or 30 years. So they, they are surveying, talking to them, and there's not all that many of them that end up in this category. But overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly more than half of the astrophysicists that we're aware of are followers of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. They believe in God. They have an understanding. I wonder if studying the stars, you know, and we've been studying the stars forever. I'm not going to say anything about astrology today. It just, you know, it just makes you think about, you know, some of that stuff is somebody's idea of an idea. So just remember that. And you have to know that God is really in control. This, the psalmist said this. I read this too. Just be still in the presence of the Lord and wait patiently for him to act. Anybody have trouble with this? Am I the only one? Okay, no, we're, we, we, we really all do struggle with this, whether we want to admit it or not. We, we do. And to wait patiently, it means that I've got to keep doing what in the meantime? Well, we've learned in this series that we've got to keep on. Over 30 plus times in the scriptures, we're told to keep on, not to give up, but to keep going, right? Well, that's why I want to close this series just today. And, uh, have a little acrostic for you to take with you just to say, where are you? Where are you in this? Where are you in this? Are, are you stuck? Well, it's okay if you are. You can get unstuck. Or are you where you want to be? Or are you on the way? Because most of us are on the way looking, just like we're on the way looking at stars and seeing the, the, the way in which God shines in the midst of a vast Unity. You know, when I see the stars and the, the, the largeness of it, it makes me think how small I am. That's what comes to my mind. But it also comes back to me that God is so big. And I think about, I think there's 8 billion people in the world, and 2 billion of them are perhaps followers of Jesus. Maybe. I mean, hope. <laughs> well, there's a long ways to go. There's 6 billion people that need help. Right? I'm going to speak to that today, too, that we live in a world that needs hope. And we have this opportunity and we have this awe and wonder we can bring to a world. So don't worry about the wicked or envy those who do wrong. Uh, for the, like the grass, they soon fade away, and like spring flowers, they soon wither. Uh, the psalmist is right. David's right. Uh, we were in the mountains uh, not too long ago. We were, uh, like I told you, I was on vacation, had some time away. We got to see the wildflowers. They're really out this year. These are more than we had seen before in some places that we've walked before. It's amazing. But you know what happens to them? They're like the grass. <laughs> they will soon fade. They will go away. And then there'll be another cycle. Do you know we live in seasons and cycles? I lived in Southern California for three years. I never really felt like I lived through seasons. I never owned a jacket. I just had a sweatshirt. I, you, know, I just, you, know, you have to experience it to know it. Now, I kind of like the seasons because it reminds me of how things are rotating, things are moving. And I think when we see it from that perspective, we understand that God really is wanting us to look a little further than the situations that we're in to get a better picture of how we're moving. Now, I've told you before that we've got about 30, I think there's about 35 times actually in the New Testament, we see the words keep on. And last week, I, or two weeks ago, I left you with these word, verses, uh, these words from verse uh, 2 of chapter 4 to the church at Colossae. Colossae is in Greece. And again, Paul's writing to a group of people that were thinkers. Greek-thinking people have always been thinkers. And guess what they also do? Because they're thinkers, they love to do one thing, argue. You ever met anybody that liked to argue? No, maybe you haven't. Maybe, maybe that doesn't happen. But if, if you've got a difference of opinion, then Paul would encourage them by saying, yeah, you can have all these things. And Paul was good at thinking about the Stoics. Stoic philosophy was very popular at the time of the Apostle Paul when he wrote. Stoicism is basically this. You, 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 you ever heard of somebody being Stoic? It's like they just don't move. And so Stoicism focused on you're not moving. In other words, you're stuck where you, you just, you're, it's almost like a fatalism. You ever heard of, a, there's religions that just believe in fatal. Oh, I, I, this is the way it is. I can't change anything. So Paul had to deal with that. 
and he had to suggest a better way of living, that the gospel can help us. And we have to keep moving. We don't just stay stuck, stoic. We don't just stay there. We're on the move. Keep on praying, he told the church of Colossae. Keep on being alert because the evil one, all they have to do is just, just throw you off a little bit. That's all the evil one really wants to do. I'm not talking about devil worship or any of that. I'm just talking about how things will come at us and we have to be alert. And then consistently through this these weeks, we've talked about how our response to all of this is to be grateful, to be grateful or thankful. We'll see it here in, in this letter uh, to the church at Colossae. He just closes it, and Eugene Peterson gives us this picture. Let the peace of Christ keep you in tune with each other, in step with each other. You're going to see this word in step, and I want you to think about steps, how we take steps. None of this going off and doing your own thing. Well, guess what? We live in a world where people are really doing their own thing, especially when it comes to Christianity. Let me just give you this one fact. I, when I was in Sunday school years and years ago uh, as a, ch a child, we talked about, we had missionaries would come and they would speak to our Sunday school class. And we were, we, this was, I was a kid. And they talked about the need. Most of them were going to Africa. Some were going to South America, and I remember t just hearing their stories. The needs were so great, and the challenge was there. Well, Paul says, cultivate thankfulness. These missionaries would talk about how they wanted to share the word of Christ. And notice these words, let the word of Christ, the message, just by the way, this is why Eugene Peterson named his paraphrase, the message. Let the word of Christ, the word of God, the message, have the run of the house. In other words, what are we, what are we up to? If our mission is to share the good news of the gospel, which is what our, those missionaries were telling us, then we would know information about that. In 1900, according to Pew Research, people's awareness level was 80% uh, of, the, of the Christian population was in North, uh, North America. And by 2005, the research indicated that it was now half that, 40%. And the rest of the, what happened over the last 50 years, because I'm old now. When I was in Sunday school, I was young. I'm old now. 50 years later, the world's changed. I don't know if us in North America have noticed it. Well, you have. Less people go to church. Less people are interested to talk about spiritual things. Less people are in community. And Paul says to the church at Colossae, don't stop meeting together. Stay in unity because our African, Asian, and Latin American Christians make up 60% of the world's population. And they believe by 2050 it will be 80%. Part of it is the largest population in the world live in Asia, Africa, and Latin America. Did you know that? If you know that about populations, our population is shrinking and the rest of the world's getting larger. We're not the major people, but the funding for these missionary efforts came from North America. The missionaries were very effective. That's what I want to say. Now, guess what? Now, we're the missionaries in our own land because we've lost a lot of context. You see that? You see the context? So now that, that's really, I'm trying to make it as simple as I can, say we've got a lot to do to help people hear that good news. And I want to say we have a message to share that's worth asking. So in this little acrostic, where are you? You first have to ask God to show you the steps because that not that what Paul said in the letter to, to the Colossians? He said, Colossians, wake up. Wake up. Jesus said these words, keep on. I wanted to give you one of the, the great uh, encouragements. We, we, saw, we see it in Matthew. We see it in Luke. It was two different authors, two different writers, two different people that were following Jesus very closely heard Jesus say, keep on. Keep on what? Keep on seeking. Keep on knocking, right? And what? The door will be opened. So we never give up. That's the followers of Jesus. That's what, that's what Jesus told his people to do. So keep asking God to show you the steps. Uh, the psalmist said it this way, commit everything you do to the Lord. In other words, you, you, you make an investment. Trust him. And what? He will help you. David believed that. Why do you think Jesus quoted David? He quoted David probably the most of all the scholars have done the work. They went back and they looked at the words of Jesus and how he taught. He would go back to David's words. Why? Why do you think that's true? Who 
lineage did Jesus come out of? David. You see, there's this connection. God had a plan. Commit everything you do to the Lord. Trust him, and he will help you. He will help you. He will guide you. Uh Uh-oh, the battery died, or I turned it off accidentally. I need you. There we go. The R in where are you is realize. Missteps are how we learn. A few weeks ago, I shared this same picture. Uh, And it shows the potter and the clay. Well, that's an old song you probably heard. Who's the, who's the potter? God. Who's the clay? Us. And God's getting a little dirty. You know, his hands are. I, that's one of the things you know about pottery, right? Some of you know that. You've done a lot more pottery than I ever have. But, but you understand that it's a little bit messy. Well, missteps are how we learn. Sometimes the Christian faith is a little bit messy. Things get goofed up. And sometimes we Christians want to hide. We do what Moses did. We put a veil over the top of our face and just say, well, I'll just stay hidden. I won't let people know. We'll just put a facade on. That's why they call it facade, <laughs> to, to hide. But we're called not to hide, right? We have to realize that our missteps is how we learn, and God is forming us and working with us and challenging us. I'll take the next slide. It looks like this is dead. So I just will give up and let, I'll need help in the back. Uh, can we go to the next slide? There we go. We, we move on in this third chapter. This is the very end of chapter 3 that leads us to chapter 4 where I told you about keep on praying, keep on being alert, and keep on being thankful. Give it plenty of room in your lives. Instruct and direct one another using good common sense. Have you ever heard of that in the Bible? Well, that's Peterson's take on this. He's saying We can use that for the purposes of God and then sing, sing, sing your hearts out to God. Why? Because it brings unity. Take the word community for a moment. Community at the end is unity. How do you get community? It takes a little bit of work. So we give it plenty of room in our lives. We let people see our lives. We instruct and direct one another using good common sense. We take practical steps to let people know that we are together. I'll just keep, I'll just point if there's, yeah, there we go. Thank you. Uh, Dallas Willard, who uh, helped me a great deal, his, his books have, have been instrumental in my life. And I, I, I just find it interesting that when I go back and I reread some things, you know, for some of us, I have to go back and uh, check my work. You, you know, they tell you in math, go back and do what? You go back and check your, see where you made the mistake. What happened? Well, Dallas Willard's like that person for me. He'll say, go back and look. He said, uh, one of the most serious failures today is the inability to provide effective, practical guidance as to how to live the life of Jesus. In fact, he talked a lot about being a Jesus, uh, not just a Jesus follower, but being an apprentice of Jesus. And, and, and that was always a confusing word because we don't really do apprenticeship stuff as much. I mean, we, some technical fields do, but, but oftentimes uh, we don't talk about that in the Christian faith. But he talked about that a lot. And in his work, he's helped us. And then he said, I believe that it's due to the very real loss of, of, uh, of biblical realism. Biblical realism. When does the Bible become real to you? Well, it only becomes real to us when we can actually put it in place. When, when, when it, and, and so oftentimes we stop reading the Bible because we're, I can't figure out, A, what's saying, and B, how it relates to my life. So if I step back long enough and say, oh, there is some value in looking at this. If I look at Psalm 37, it's for today. Because I can see for a fact that there's a lot of things going wrong in this world. And I can say that I'm not sure what steps to take to get out of that. So I ask God to help me. I realize that my missteps will teach me, right? And then uh, we, we'll go to the next slide. We'll see uh, th- this uh, Center for, uh, for Courage and Renewal is a, is, a, is a contemplative think tank. And I really love some of the material that comes out of it because it's really practical. And this writer, Shelley Francis, makes this point. She says, speak your truth in ways that respect other people's truth. Do you ever, have you noticed that we've had a loss, of, loss of respect for what other people think? And she's just saying, practically, I want you to step back for a moment. Just step back away and look at it. Richard Rohr makes some of these same suggestions, and I've really been helped. 
And in the next slide, you'll see what she says. She says, when you're getting to know people, it's vital to share stories across lines of difference. If you're only hanging out with people that are like you, you're probably going to get bored. <laughs> right? Or you're going to try to pick a fire. You know, there's differences in all of us. I mean, some of us are Dodger fans, some of us are Giants fans, or some of us are A's fans. Or whatever, it doesn't matter. So we're all different. And then it is helpful to, when we get to know people, not to debate who's right or wrong, which is right, and not to what? To cast blame or shame. Some of us in our families grew up with a lot of that. They call them the twin, the twin towers of, of challenge. Because if we grew up with a lot of that, it throws us off. Blame and shame will, will goof us up. Oh, I'll try a new battery, or maybe I just pilot air. My thumb doesn't quite work right. Uh, when we enlist a friend, and that's the last part of this little acrostic, when we enlist a friend, we're actually taking the Bible and putting it into action. Solomon, one of the wisest people in the Bible, as we were told, he asked for a double dose of wisdom. When he got out, what do, you, what do you want? He said, I want wisdom. This is what he said. Ecclesiastes 4, two is better than one. Now, you might have even heard that. In fact, there's a lot of advice out there that tells you this is a good idea because two are better than one because they can help each other succeed. If one person falls, the other person can reach out and what? Help. That is the best description of the church of Jesus Christ. Isn't that what Jesus would want of us is to enlist a friend, to be helpful, to know that you're not alone, that you're getting help. And when we enlist a friend, we're taking steps of practical biblical Knowledge, we're putting Bible to work. Notice this other uh, wisdom that I got from Shelley, uh, Shelley Francis. Go ahead and go to the next slide. We'll see that. When, God, when the going gets rough, turn to wonder. If you feel judgmental or defensive, ask yourself, I wonder what brought you her to this belief. I, I wonder what he's feeling right now. I wonder what my reaction teaches me about me. You know, if you start thinking, you know, I gave you these beautiful pictures. We saw and we sang them, the God of wonders. We saw the picture. I wonder. But I, as you leave today, I want you to take wonder with you. I wonder. I wonder what got people to thinking the way that was it blame and shame that got them stuck? Maybe, maybe. I don't know. We don't know their story. We need to find out their story. I wonder what brought he or her to this play for what he's feeling right now. What my reaction, why do I react the way that I react? We all do. We're programmed when we come into this world in our family of origins. We all, we all have them in some shape or form, right? And sometimes it throws us off. We come to Jesus and we say, oh, I love that truth. But how do I apply it and say, oh, yeah, God has a better idea. Well, let me suggest a couple of things. The first one is to think about how we can take small steps. A few years ago, uh, in fact, it's a number of years ago, probably 20 years ago. So if you're younger, you're not even going to know what this movie is. It's a movie called What About Bob? You ever heard of What About Bob? Okay. It was a silly and stupid movie, right? We can all admit it. Richard Dreyfuss and, and, uh, and Bill Murray are two, two pretty funny people. And uh, Bill Murray does his best, I think, one of his best things, only because the movie's about What About Bob? And I can remember it. So, I, but, but, but Bill Murray was, was just terribly Oh, he was all over Richard, and all he wanted to do was go on vacation. Remember that? And he, he just got into his life. He got into, and he just made a mess of everything. And there was, in this story, right, Richard Drivers had written a book, and he talked about baby steps. Remember that? Taking baby steps. I think, after you watch this video, I want you to watch, it's just a short video. I want you to think how taking smaller steps is actually more effective than trying to take the giant leap in trying to do fix or do anything. Watch it and you'll see. So, maybe you're thinking about making some big changes or setting some ambitious goals for yourself. Maybe you want to lose 20 pounds or read through the Bible. Maybe you want to run a marathon or repair a broken relationship. Whatever your big goal is, the temptation is to expect to go straight from here to here or from here to here. The reality is, 
there are a lot of small steps between big decisions and big results. Challenges and obstacles await. At some point, you might even want to quit. But stand firm. Don't be disappointed with slow progress. Don't be overwhelmed by the destination. Rather, focus on what you can do today. Skip dessert. Read a chapter. Go for a run. Make a phone call. The more difficult the journey, the more rewarding the destination. And it can all start today with just one small step. One small step. Isn't that what gets us launched in anything we do? Baby steps, whatever you want to call it. I think sometimes we're overwhelmed. We think, ah, oh, this is too daunting. This is too much. Well, you know, if you miss a meal, I remember Rick Warren saying that. If you miss something, if you study, you're reading the Word, and you miss something, no big deal. You can read more the next time. If you miss a meal, you can eat more the next time. Well, whatever it is, right? So sometimes we think we have to know it all when really, really, all we need is what we need to be doing today. What it, is this good for you today? Or oh, is it just one day? I would encourage you. My dream for you is that this God's Word guides you every day. It has the full capacity to guide every step you take. And the decisions we make, yeah, they can impact us. In fact, they do impact us. Notice what uh, Paul does is he closes this chapter and leads us into chapter 4 where he said, keep on going, keep on going. He says this, let every detail in your lives, words and actions, whatever be done in the name of the Master, in the name of Jesus. Thanking God the Father every step of the way. <laughs> wow. If we didn't learn anything else in the last six weeks of looking at this, it is that we have to thank God for whatever, wherever we are on the journey. And when we do that, when we thank God for that, then we are able to just take that tiny step forward and to know that God is with us, revealing each step of the way, right? Every little aspect, words and actions. I can change. Things can change. Biblical realism comes when, when I read in the Psalms, is to be still and know that God is real and he's speaking to us and giving us help. So let every detail in your lives, words and actions, whatever, be done in the name of Jesus and then be thankful, be grateful, keep on praying, keep on being alert. Isn't that what Paul said to the church at Colossae? Never give up and be grateful. Cultivate, cultivate thankfulness. Lord, we thank you for being with us in these days. And we know your message is always the same. You remind us, you remind us of the truth of your word, that your truth is for us. You're for us. You're helping us and guiding us. And we just need to get on board and take small steps forward. So today, Lord, wherever we are on this journey, we just pray that you be with us, reminding us that as we are thankful for whatever you've provided for us, that we look forward and to finding ways that we can connect to people in this world because we have a message, that message of peace. We can bring peace to a world that is very, very challenging, up and down and all around. That's the norm of the world, but Lord, you bring peace. Let us be instruments of your peace in every way. We pray this prayer in the name that is above every name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand and sing together in unity. Amen. Yes, moment by moment. Let the glory of the Lord rise among us. 
and let the joy of the Lord overwhelm anyone you come in contact with now and forevermore. Amen.